This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The next uh, topic discussion is um, going to be portal vein thrombosis. That's something that we encounter all the time about what to do, and there are both medical and surgical issues. I'd like to introduce our two speakers who, who will share the, uh, the stage, uh, starting with Jennifer Price. So uh, while you know that many of our new faculties are homegrown, uh, Jennifer is one that we stole couple years ago from uh, Johns Hopkins, and, uh, and she's been a, a real delight to work with, and uh, she really brought uh, really valuable expertise in viral hepatitis as well as HIV and uh, liver disease. We are really happy to have you join us, and uh, also Sangmo Kang. Where's Sangmo? So Sangmo is one of our transplant surgeons. Uh, who is a card-carrying immunologist who really excels from bench to bedside and is really widely recognized as uh, an amazingly skilled surgeon. So I look forward to having both of you discuss about portal vein thrombosis and medical and surgical issues. Thank you, Francis, for that introduction. So I will start with the medical considerations and then saying what we'll take over with the surgical considerations. Here are my disclosures. So this is a fairly common clinical scenario, a 59-year-old male with hepatitis C cirrhosis and small varices, MELD score of 12, who had an ultrasound for HCC surveillance and the ultrasound showed new portal vein thrombosis. So over the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I'd I'm planning on addressing some important questions that arise in this sort of a clinical scenario, including how common is portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis? Does portal vein thrombosis impact pre and post transplant outcomes? What is the optimal management of portal vein thrombosis pre transplant? And then I'll briefly address some issues around whether we can prevent portal vein thrombosis. In terms of the prevalence, as you all know, it's quite common, ranging from 10 to 25% of patients with cirrhosis. The incidence among liver transplant uh, waiting list patients ranges from 7 to 16 percent per year. And in terms of the risk factors, an important risk factor not on this slide is malignancy. And that was intentional because the purpose of this talk is to focus on patients with non-malignant uh, thrombosis. The other risk factors include portal flow characteristics and coagulation abnormalities. Regarding the portal vein flow, decreased velocity of portal vein flow appears to be the most important local factor for thrombosis. In a study uh, published in Journal of Hepatology in 2009, a portal vein velocity of less than 15 centimeters per second on ultrasound was associated with a 45 times higher odds of portal vein thrombosis. And another study has shown that increased severity of cirrhosis is inversely proportional to portal vein flow velocity, which may explain why we are more likely to see portal vein thrombosis in our patients with more advanced cirrhosis. In terms of other local risk factors, these include portal vein endothelial injury, for example, during surgery like splenectomy or hepatectomy, as well as portal vein endothelial inflammation, which can occur in the setting of pancreatitis, cholecystitis, appendicitis, and other intra-abdominal infections. Various systemic thrombotic risk factors have also been associated with portal vein thrombosis in the setting of cirrhosis, and all of these uh, listed on this slide have been associated in various series. So what about outcomes in portal vein thrombosis? So there's some good evidence that portal vein thrombosis does increase adverse outcomes in patients with cirrhosis and a variceal bleed. And I've just included a couple of these studies for you here. The first two focus on the risk of rebleeding in patients with cirrhosis and a variceal bleed. And you can see that the risk of rebleeding is higher among patients with cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis as compared to patients with cirrhosis and no thrombosis. 
And similarly, there's a higher risk of mortality after variceal bleed in patients with cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis. Whether or not portal vein thrombosis actually increases the risk of progression of liver disease or instead is really just a marker of more uh, advanced liver disease remains to be seen. And the studies are really conflicting regarding this, so it's really unclear. And similarly, it's not clear whether or not portal vein thrombosis itself increases the risk of pre-transplant mortality. So this summarizes just a few of the studies looking at waitlist mortality and portal vein thrombosis. The largest is from the SRTR data set up here with uh, 46,000, over 46,000 patients, and they actually found no difference in waitlist mortality among patients with portal vein thrombosis. In contrast, a large single stu uh, center study at the University of Michigan with over 3,000 patients who were evaluated for transplant did show a significantly increased risk of pre-transplant mortality among the patients with complete portal vein thrombosis. And a recent abstract presented at ASLD this year also showed a higher odds of um, pre-transplant mortality among listed patients with complete portal vein thrombosis. There does appear to be some evidence that portal vein thrombosis increases post-transplant mortality. And this slide summarizes the re results of several studies looking at 30-day post-transplant mortality, comparing patients without portal vein thrombosis at the time of transplant, and those are the orange bars, to patients with portal vein thrombosis at the time of transplant, which is the purple bars. And as you can see here, some studies showed no difference with or without portal vein thrombosis at the time of transplant, whereas others did show a significant difference. And in the pooled analysis, the 30-day mortality Post-transplant was 7.7% in patients without portal vein thrombosis and 10.5% in patients with portal vein thrombosis, which was a significant difference. And similarly, one-year mortality was higher among patients with portal vein thrombosis at around 19% as compared to 15% without portal vein thrombosis. It does appear that the post-transplant mortality risk is really within that first year post-transplant. And looking a little bit further into who exactly would be at risk post-transplant with portal vein thrombosis, it's really the patients with complete rather than partial portal vein thrombosis. So there were four studies that differentiated between partial and complete portal vein thrombosis. And um, on this slide, the partial thrombosis patients are in orange and the complete are in purple. And you can see here that the risk is really among those that have complete thrombosis. And again, on this pooled analysis, the 30-day mortality was around 6% in the patients with partial portal vein thrombosis as compared to 18% in those with complete. So moving on to the medical management of portal vein thrombosis, the two primary uh, management strategies include therapeutic anticoagulation, which is the most common um, strategy, and TIPS. So here I've just summarized the efficacy of therapeutic anticoagulation through about a dozen studies over the past decade. What you can see here, we're looking at the percent of patients who have complete or partial resolution of their portal vein thrombus with anticoagulation. And you can see that the uh, percent ranges from 42% to as high as 100%. What's important to note is that um, these are primarily single center studies. There's a large degree of heterogeneity in terms of the study populations, specifically the acuity of the thrombus and the extent of the thrombus. One theme that emerges looking at these studies is that early initiation of anticoagulation is associated with a higher likelihood of recanalization, and extent of thrombus is also associated with recanalization. So the more extensive the thrombus, the less likely the patient is going to either partially or completely resolve the thrombus. That being said, even with complete occlusion, there may be some benefit in terms of preventing thromb thrombus um, progression. So what about the safety of therapeutic anticoagulation? Here are uh, some complications that were seen in, the, in six of the prior studies. Um, and I won't go through all the details, but in general, actually, the, the risks were pretty low. There weren't that many complications of anticoagulation. So actually, a lot lower than we might expect. But what I'd highlight here is, first of all, the small number of patients in each of the studies, and the study design, you can see almost all of them were single center, and many of them were retrospective. So this is probably a pretty select patient population, and whether or not these results are really generalizable to our patients is, is unclear. So to summarize anticoagulation for portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis, these studies do appear to support anticoagulant use. That being said, 
Um, there, there aren't any really high quality studies. There's no randomized controlled trial of, of anticoagulation for treatment of portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis. Um, so it still has to, we still have to consider it really on a case by case basis, weighing the risks uh, versus the benefits for our individual patients. It does appear that earlier use is associated with higher recanalization rates. And there are several unresolved issues, including the optimal choice of anticoagulation. The studies all use different uh, anticoagulation strategies, primarily low molecular weight heparin with or without um, vitamin K antagonists. Also, what's the optimal anticoagulant dosing and the duration of treatment? A few of the studies uh, did show fairly uh, high rethrombosis risk once the anticoagulation was stopped, which would suggest that if we're going to anticoagulate our patients, we'll have to do it up until transplant. Also, how is the best way to monitor patients on anticoagulation? How reliable is INR in our patients with cirrhosis, um, as well as anti-10A levels? And ultimately, who really are the optimal candidates for anticoagulation? So moving on to tips for portal vein thrombosis. This is less commonly used um, as compared to anticoagulation. And it's typically considered in the setting of symptomatic portal hypertension or in patients that have progression of their thrombus despite anticoagulation. And there are three primary technical strategies that can be employed when using tips for portal vein thrombosis. The first is to place the tips, and that's often followed by portal vein recanalization via portosystemic shunting. The second is to actually recanalize the portal vein via percutaneous approaches and then place the tips, which this is obviously more technically complicated. And the third is to insert the tips between a hepatic vein and a large collateral vessel without uh, main portal vein recanalization. And the purpose of this is to prevent thrombus extension because of portosystemic shunting. So pros and cons of tips, the pros are that you can recanalize the portal vein with endovascular techniques. It will also resolve symptomatic portal hypertension, and as I mentioned, prevent extension of thrombus by creating a portosystemic shunt. The disadvantages are that it's technically challenging, and then of course there are the complications associated with tips, including hepatic encephalopathy, worsening hepatic decompensation, et cetera. When it is used, it's actually technically successful in the majority of cases, 67 to 100% of cases. And if it is, if the TIPS insertion is technically successful, it's actually associated with a very high rate of portal vein recanalization, up to 80%. The procedure-related complications vary. And an outstanding question is really when the optimal timing is to perform TIPS. And for that reason, there's actually a randomized controlled trial underway comparing TIPS versus endoscopy for varices, obliteration, followed by anticoagulation for management of portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis. So I briefly just wanted to touch upon prophylaxis against portal vein thrombosis in patients with cirrhosis, because many of you may be aware of the study that was published in gastroenterology a couple years ago in which um, it was a randomized control trial. They enrolled 70 patients with decompensated cirrhosis, primarily child's B cirrhosis. Um, to receive either prophylactic doses of anoxaparin or placebo. And the treatment arm was treated for 12 months, and then everybody was followed up for at least an additional 12 months. There was one patient that had to stop the anoxaparin because they developed heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and there were three episodes of variceal bleeding, two in the treatment group and one in the placebo group. And you can see here that nobody in the treatment group developed an acute thrombus while on treatment, whereas 16% of the placebo arm did. At the end of follow-up, 8% of patients in the treatment arm versus 27% of patients in the placebo arm had developed a portal vein thrombosis. There was also a lower rate of hepatic decompensation in the treatment arm. And when they just compared overall survival just head-to-head -head among the groups, there was not a significant difference. But when they actually did a survival analysis, and here survival is, is the last one here, um, the probability of survival was actually higher in the treatment arm compared to the placebo arm. So here's the Kaplan-Meier curve. The treatment group is in the, the treatment group is in the black line, and the placebo group is in the dotted line. So a higher chance of survival with treatment, and then moving over to the other Kaplan-Meier curves, a higher probability of portal vein thrombosis in the placebo arm, and a higher probability of decompensation in the placebo arm. 
So this is fairly compelling, but it's just one trial and certainly not enough to support the use of prophylactic um, anoxaparin in all of our patients with cirrhosis to prevent the development of portal vein thrombosis. So um, I'll end with this potential algorithm for the medical management of portal vein thrombosis, but I really want to emphasize that there are no consensus guidelines uh, for us to follow, primarily because really of the dearth of, of strong evidence supporting anticoagulation uh, or TIPS one way or another in use with portal vein thrombosis. So we really have to consider the risk benefit of anticoagulation or TIPS on a case-by-case -case basis. So moving through this algorithm, you have a patient with portal vein thrombosis and cirrhosis. You first want to assess whether or not they have symptomatic portal hypertension. If they do have symptomatic portal hypertension, is it controlled by medical management? So is there other symptoms controlled by endoscopic therapy, by large volume paras, by uh, medication? If so, it's reasonable to consider anticoagulation in that patient if you think that the benefits outweigh the risk. And if the thrombus progresses despite anticoagulation, then consider TIPS if they are a candidate. In patients with uncontrolled symptomatic portal hypertension, then it would be reasonable to start with the TIPS as this would prevent progression of the thrombus and also treat the portal hypertension. And patients without symptomatic portal hypertension, if the thrombus is less than 50% of the portal vein and does not extend to the SMV, then it's reasonable to really wait and see because a sizable minority of patients with a partial portal vein thrombosis will actually spontaneously recanalize. If it improves or is stable, then you can just continue to follow them. But if it progresses, then consider anticoagulation. And a patient with greater than 50% thrombus with or without SMV extension, then I'd consider anticoagulation. And now I'll let Sangmo take over to talk about the surgical options when these medical treatments fail. All right. Let me see if I better not put my belly up to the computer here. <laughs> mine's, not, not, mine's not quite as big, so hopefully it'll be all right. Let's see. Where does my presentation go? There we go. Oh, here we go. Great. All right, well, thank you all for coming and uh, being so attentive and asking great questions. It's great to see some familiar faces and also some new, new faces as well. So I'm going to talk about the surgical considerations and, and knowing that very few of you will be scrubbing in with us to actually deal with this. You can just kind of relax and look at the nice pictures. Um, but it's something that it, it, when we see somebody with portal vein thrombosis on the docket for surgery, we know it's going to be a difficult operation. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, types of portal vein thrombosis that we see, the surgical management uh, intraoperatively, and then uh, uh, a little bit about outcomes, although uh, we've already had a nice discussion of that. And then the issue of diffuse mesenteric thrombosis, which is a real uh, difficult issue <clears throat> for, for very few patients, but it is when we see it, it's very difficult. So in terms of... Uh, the types of portal vein thrombosis that we see, much of what we see is really this, what we call partial portal vein thrombosis, where it's not occluding the portal vein. Um, and it's usually relatively posterior for whatever reason. And this is something that's very easy to deal with in the operating room in general. It does set up an inflammatory reaction in the port of hepatis, so everything's kind of stuck and it's a little bit more difficult than someone who doesn't have a thrombosis. But really, this, this should really be considered a separate entity because if you look at all the studies, the partial portal vein thrombosis doesn't have a real impact on survival <coughs> uh, by and large. This uh, type B is the most common type of portal vein thrombosis. It's a short segment, and <coughs> what's really happening here is that the coronary vein right here is acting as the, as the outflow, and so you have clotting up to the coronary vein, uh, and you have, of course, lots of varices that you guys were just talking about, beta blocker versus banding. And this is, that's what we see most of the time. And this is something that we, we can also deal with relatively straightforward fashion. This is sort of just an extension of that where it's gone beyond the, the coronary vein into the splenic vein. and. Uh, uh, into, down into the SMV or superior mesenteric vein. This is something that we don't see very often, and if it's really uh, stuck all the way down here, it can be very difficult to thrombectomize. And also, this also sets you up for left-sided portal hypertension, which 
will often cause very severe bleeding. So this is not something that we see a lot at the time of transplant, this splenic vein thrombosis. The other, the worst kind of thrombosis is what we call this diffuse thrombosis, where this clot has gone all the way down and actually usually goes into the tributaries of the superior mesenteric vein and also into the splenic vein. And I'll show you a few cases of that. And so then you're left with nothing to plug into. You know, we're, we're basically plumbers and we need, we need some inflow. So this is the most standard type of uh, procedure that we perform, and, and, and it's basically called an eversion thrombectomy. And um, is there a pointer up here? Just to use the mouse, okay. So um, what we do, basically, we've, we've uh, divided the portal vein, the, the liver's up here. And now what we do is, th this is uh, the, the thrombus, and we just basically, and there's always a plane between the, the thrombus and the vessel wall, and it's fairly easy to, to develop. So it's really, the hard part is actually not starting to mobilize here, but getting all the way down in here to try to thrombectomize this, this tongue that might be going down into the SMV, and is really limiting your, your inflow. And there are multiple ways of, of dealing with that, but basically the goal is to just extract almost the entire clot. And, uh, and here what you see is a, a Fogarty balloon that's been put down into the SMV. Some people will put another balloon down in here. Some people will just use their hand in the operating room to occlude both veins while they're trying to fish out this clot. You can just imagine how much blood might be coming out if we let go. Um, and we, generally we know that we've done enough when we let the clamp go and it's, it scares the heck out of us, you know? <laughs> kind of audible bleeding and then you know you've, you've got good inflow. <laughs> There are times when we can't, when we do all that we can do and we, don't, we just don't get enough flow back, or it's been so chronic that it's, it's down to this little twig of, of fiber, then we really have no choice but to do a, a bypass. And this is an example of uh, the typical type of bypass that we do. So this is a superior mesenteric vein here, and this is the cl clotted portal vein, which is now divided and, and left alone. And so we, we uh, sew the donor iliac vein so, you know, conduit basically from the donor and sew it to the superior mesenteric vein and then bring it behind the stomach anterior to the, to the pancreas and bring it up to the portal vein and that works out quite nicely. So that's, you know, uh, uh, a very common operation that we do as well. There's some additional uh, considerations. Oops. Uh, large portal venous collaterals appear to predispose to portal vein thrombosis. So. You know, we always consider ligating large collateral vessels at the time of uh, transplant because we don't want that, those collateral stealing flow actually from, from the portal vein. Uh, if the patient has had a prior splenorenal shunt, then sometimes it's difficult to get in and try to ligate the shunt itself, so we'll actually ligate the left renal, art, uh, left renal vein because that's where all the flow is going into. Uh, in order to increase flow through the portal vein. But that's something that we rarely have to do. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in terms of the ligation of the collaterals and stuff like that, that's why it's nice to have preoperative imaging uh, so we know kind of where to look for the collateral. Sometimes it can be uh, retroperitoneal, and those are very difficult to get at. Um, we also, of course, want preoperative imaging, usually a CT angio, just to see what type of thrombosis that we have, of course, so we know what we're dealing with going in. If we have a patient with recurrent thrombosis, then we really look for a, a, a collateral that might be stealing blood flow from the main portal vein, and we've had a case like that uh, uh, recently, so uh, good uh, re-emphasis for us to try to deal with these collaterals at the time of transplant. Um, and when we do see these collaterals, they can sometimes be embolized by interventional radiology if they're already, say, a month out from transplant. So we've had a, a, a case like that uh, re recently as well. Uh, Jennifer talked to you about the increased mortality. Again, typically there, there's some, there are smaller studies, but uh, partial portal vein thrombosis really is not associated with higher mortality. So when you see par partial portal vein thrombosis in your patients, I wouldn't worry too much about it except consider whether or not you should treat or not to prevent full thrombosis. But very few people, I think, are, are willing to anticoagulate their cirrhotic patient. Um, 
And, and again, complete portal vein thrombosis is associated with, with the higher mortality. So in terms of large database uh, series, so the, you know, the UNOS database, uh, when they looked at that, unfortunately the database is not granular, so they, they don't distinguish between partal, partial portal vein thrombosis and complete. But if you take all comers, there is an increased post-transplant mortality of about, uh, you know, risk factor of 1.32, and that's statistically significant. Uh, so that's actually one of our risk stratifiers when we fill out a form in the operating room. We say whether they, or not they've had a portal vein thrombe or thrombus, because that actually impacts survival. Um, what about post-transplant? We usually just have them on aspirin. We rarely, if, if ever, uh, use Coumadin unless they have a hypercoagulable state. And recurrent thrombosis is, is very unusual, which is amazing to me sometimes to think about because we're fishing this big clot out. We're not using any anticoagulation, but it's such a high flow system that, it, and patients tend to be coagulopathic anyway. So I think we don't really uh, see, we see very few problems with recurrent thrombosis. What about diffuse portomesenteric thrombosis, where again, you have really nothing uh, to thrombectomize or to bypass? That's, that's you know, there's a rare patient like that, one or two a year that might, might show up. And so the question is, how do you obtain portal inflow? Well, there's been several uh, uh, different ways uh, that people have tried. One is cable portal transposition, where you're basically hooking up the, uh, uh, here's a picture of it, but this is the vena cava with the renal veins, <clears throat> and then basically just tapering it and hooking it straight up to the portal vein, so all your lower body blood flow going through the liver. Um, amazing. <laughs> this is another variation. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a strange concept, you know, when you think about it. And here's another variation where they're basically ligated uh, or clipped the, the vena cava and then, uh, or sometimes they narrow it and then they'll hook a portal vein in to the side of the vena cava. And something that's much more uh, common uh, lately, I believe, and catching on is the idea of renal portal transposition. So taking the left renal vein and swinging it up and hooking that up to the portal vein because there's a nice size match. There's a lot of collateral veins draining into the left renal vein through the, through the splenic collaterals. And so that's, that's actually a really nice option, and I'll show you some examples. The other option that a lot of people have uh, advocated, uh, especially uh, those centers that want to do intestine transplants, is actually putting in an entirely new SMV and portal system by putting in the liver and the small intestine and the pancreas, and that's obviously a, another way of getting at it. And, and you know, I, we shouldn't downplay it because it's really, if, so, if a patient has uh, severe variceal bleeding as part of their disease, you're not gonna cure that with these other types of inflow. You're not curing the, the uh, portal hypertension and bleeding, so that, that's a real issue. So <clears throat> here's just a few examples uh, uh, of patients uh, that have been transplanted. This is actually a patient that was uh, transplanted when I was a fellow uh, by Nancy and John, but you can see here, this, this is the vena cava. There's actually a stent in because he's had a DVT. But if you follow it up, you can see it kind of going up in here, and you can actually finally see it going into the liver. So this vena cava has basically been detached and then plugged right into the portal vein. And amazingly enough, he's, he's, still, you know, he's, he's still alive after you know, almost a decade and a half. And that's pretty amazing. If, if you had, this kind of patient would have gotten a small bowel transplant. There's very few small bowel transplant patients alive after 10 years. So I think, you know, again, the, despite the fact that he did have multiple complications, which, you know, some are ongoing, you know, he's alive and actually doing pretty well. So again, a, a, a good option. Uh, I think it's not the favorite option uh, these days. This is a patient who was referred to me for a, uh, combined liver intestine transplant, and you can see that, um, first of all, there, this is the splenic vein, it's supposed to be the splenic vein, but there's nothing lighting up. This is the portal veins, but what's supposed to be the portal vein, there's nothing there but clot. But you do see lots of collaterals. <clears throat> and here, just another cut coming up. Again, tons of collaterals. The portal vein's out. There's some big collaterals running alongside. And 
What was interesting was, you know, as we, oops, going wrong direction. As we came up, this is a, a different view, but you could see that this huge collateral was, was right next to the port of Hapter. It's probably a, a, a pericolidocal collateral that we call. And so I recommended that this patient actually just undergo a liver transplant, hooking into the collateral. And actually, Sandy Feng transplanted this patient <clears throat> about uh, five or six years ago. And he's doing great. And all of his actually hasn't had any bleeding. All of his society is resolved. So this is a guy who otherwise might have gotten a liver small bowel transplant. So again, you know, doing much better than what a standard uh, intestinal transplant patient would do. This is a patient uh, that also was referred to me for a liver intestine transplant. And uh, again, here uh, on this scan, you can see a, a bunch of collaterals. But there's really no dominant collateral. And this is just going down. Again, there's lots of collaterals here on this left side. You can see all this, sort of this blush of collaterals. And then lots of little collaterals, but nothing really dominant that we could think of plugging into. So, and here's, uh, here's the level of the renal vein here. Again, just lots of little collaterals everywhere. So we did, uh, 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 I actually did a renal portal transposition on him. And uh, so this is, this is not the actual picture of the surgery, but this is an example. This is the vena cava. This is the left renal vein coming in. So he's got a clamp on the left renal vein. This is actually quite straightforward at the time of transplant. And uh, then that's divided. And then here's the divided renal, left renal vein orifice being sewn to the portal vein of the donor. And actually, it, it, usually you have enough portal vein, you don't even need an extension graft or anything. And you can see how well matched they are in size. So that's what we did. And this is a picture, a CT of this patient, uh, which was obtained for other reasons. But you can see this left renal vein. You can see how big it is, because there's a lot of collaterals coming in there. And then this left renal vein is going all the way up into the liver, so you can kind of see that. And here's a, a more posterior cut showing these big collaterals coming from that, you know, that nest of left-sided varices that, we, that are being drained. So, and that patient has done overall quite well. So um, which method is best? You know, there's lots of small cases. No, there's no real large databases to draw any real conclusions from. A uh, big key to understand is that unless you're replacing the small bowel, that portal hypertension is not immediately relieved. There is some evidence that over time, more collaterals develop, and, and you know, the portal hypertension does get better over time. But if, if you have a patient who's bleeding a lot, it's really not an option. And then <clears throat> cable transposition is, it has a lot of complications, including DVT, lower extremity swelling, as you might imagine, renal insufficiency because of the higher pressures. And so that's really falling out of favor. I think a lot more people are, are, are uh, thinking about doing renal portal uh, transpositions. Again, this is not an operation that anyone does with any regularity, fortunately. And then combined liver small bowel transplant is an option, but just realizing that it's a high morbidity type of transplant with long-term survivals that are not as good as, as liver transplant alone. So in conclusion, short segment portal venous thrombosis is really not anywhere near a contraindication to transplant. There may be slightly more morbidity or mortality with uh, uh, full portal uh, thrombosis, but it, it's a, really a, a, a marginal effect. And so uh, those patients should really not be in any way uh, 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 turned down for transplant. There are, there are actually centers that will refer us patients, transplant centers that refer patients to us because they have portal vein thrombosis, and we're, of course, happy for that, but it, it is a more difficult operation. And then the diffuse thrombosis is a, is a rare but, but uh, formidable challenge uh, that, that you know, we're still struggling with, but we do have uh, alternatives. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen and Sangmo, for wonderful talks. Um, I think one of the take-home messages really, you know, uh, there are transplant centers that uh, 
would consider portal vein thrombosis a relative contraindication or absolute contraindication, and we're lucky to have you guys who are willing to take on these patients as long as the SMV is patent. So.